Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Cross-Laminated Timber Shear Wall Example. My name is Marcy Weber, and I'll be the education team moderator for today's presentation. Today's speaker is our very own Phil Line, Vice President of Codes and Regulations, and Omar Amini, Manager of Wind and Seismic Engineering. Uh, please note that this webinar and associated slides should not be used as a substitute for competent engineering support and expertise. Additionally, the webinar is being recorded, and by remaining a participant, you automatically consent to such recordings. If you do not consent to being recorded, please disconnect from the session. And here's the behind the scenes team that's providing this course for you today. Our engineering moderator today is our Director of Education Outreach, Lori Cook. She'll be moderating the question and answers. And all things education and certification is provided by myself, Manager of Education and Accreditation, Marcy Weber, and Education Administrator, Kim Paulson. Again, our presenters here are Phil Line, Vice President of Codes and Regulations here at AWC, and Omar Amini, our Manager of Wind and Seismic Engineering. And without further ado, ado let us give you over to, I think it's Omar, no, it's Phil that goes first. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you. First, I wanted to say hello to the audience. Uh, this webinar is to provide information on the cross laminated timber shear wall design example appearing in the 2020 NEHER provisions design examples publication. The example is based on application of provisions for cross laminated timber shear wall design and 2021 special design provisions for wind and seismic and associated seismic design coefficients R, C, D, and Omega appearing in ASCE 722. The format for today's program is approximately 45 minutes of presentation split between speakers, Omar Amini and me, followed by Q&A. Uh, we ask for folks to keep an eye on the slide number if there's a question and ask it at the end. The American Wood Council is a registered provider with the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education Systems. And here's a disclaimer required by our lawyers. This presentation provides background on the new cross laminated timber shear wall system and illustrates application of the design requirements through an example. Objectives, be introduced to the design requirements for CLT shear walls appearing in SPIDWIS 21, Appendix B. Learn about seismic design coefficients and the associated height limits for the CLT shear wall system appearing in ASCE 722. Learn about the CLT shear wall design example appearing in the 2020 NEHAR provisions, design examples, and gain awareness of application of CLT shear wall requirements for shear strength, overturning, and deflection. The written example is about 25 pages and is laid out to show how to apply specific provisions of ASCE 722 and SPIDWIS 21 for the design of a CLT shear wall. The example focuses on a single extracted CLT wall line, a long line four, as shown in the typical floor plan in the lower right figure. The corresponding building elevation for a three-story townhome structure is shown in the figure on the upper right. The design example includes calculation of CLT shear wall in-plane shear strength, hold down size and compression zone length for overturning, and CLT shear wall deflection. Key resources for the design example include ASCE 722, minimum design loads and associated criteria for buildings and other structures, which provides seismic design criteria and seismic design coefficients such as R, C, D, and Omega for the CLT shear wall system. Special design provisions for wind and seismic, also known as SPIDWIS, which provides requirements for the design of cross laminated timber shear walls, requirements for angle connectors at top and bottom of the wall, and for connectors at the adjoining vertical panel edge. National Design Specification for Wood Construction 2018, which provides requirements for structural design of cross laminated timber members themselves, for resistance to shear, tension, and compression, as well as connection design and CLT. PRG 320, which is the CLT product standard. The 2020 NEHER provisions, which uh, contain design requirements very similar to those appearing in SPIDWIS 21 and the same seismic coefficients for the system appearing in ASCE 722. 
Before we go any further in the example, I'd like to turn it over to Omar for background on the CLT shearwall system. Thank you, Phil, and hello, everyone. Um, the CLT shearwall system is included in AC722 table 12.2-1. Uh, There's two variants of the system that are currently recognized, cross-laminated timber shearwalls with R factor of three, overstrength factor of three, and deflection amplification factor of three, and cross-laminated timber shield walls with shear resistance provided by high aspect ratio panels only. And this aspect ratio is defined as a, a height of the panel over length of the panel, and we're gonna get later. The system has an R factor of four, over strength factor of three, and deflection amplification factor of four. And both these systems are applicable to the structural height of 65 feet, up to 65 feet, and uh, for seismic design categories B through F. And uh, one important aspect of this table is reference to section 14.5 in column two, and uh, Phil is gonna get to that later. So what is CLT? So cross-laminated timber is a prefabricated engineered wood product consisting of at least three layers of solid stone lumber or structural composite lumber where adjacent layers are cross-oriented and bonded with a structural adhesive. And it's normally provided with three, five, or seven layers with the outer layers and uh, oriented in parallel direction, of course, for the strength and stiffness purposes. Research and development for CLT began in the early 1990s in Europe with the fir first production facilities established in 1994 in Austria, Germany, and Switzerland, which to this day produce bulk of the CLT around the world. And uh, the term cross-laminated timber CLT itself was coined in 2000 at the COSI 5 conference in Italy. To give you a little bit of uh, background on motivation for the CLT Surewall system that was eventually standardized in SPIDWIS and AC7, I'd like to show you some examples internationally and in the US that feature CLT shear walls in platform type construction. So this is um, building is a nine story residential structure known as Stadthaus in London, which I think now is referred to as graphite building that had only nine weeks of CLT construction, which speed of construction that we're familiar with with CLT. And there was four laborers and one um, supervisor. So for the same building, we see use of panelized construction to aid in the speed of construction. Again, with uh, familiar with CLT. And the panels are then lifted and placed on floor panels and metal connectors pre-installed at locations where these walls would eventually go. And for the same building, here's an example of what, what, what it looks like on the inside. In the left figure, um, we see that platform type construction that I was talking about earlier, where um, walls are attached to the floor below and above using metal connectors. And the, in the figure to the upper right, panels and connectors are visible at this stage of the construction. And then these are then covered with the finished material like the one shown in the bottom um, right figure. So that example was an international example. And then this is in the US. Here's an example of a four-story CLT building at Fort Drum, New York. And uh, looking at the photo on the left, you can see uh, where platform type construction is used, where floor panels bear on the wall panels below. And progressing from the bottom story to the upper story, we can see wall panel, then floor, then wall panel, and so on. The new um, GLT Shiro wall system standardized in SPIDWIS and AC7 has similarities to the former examples that are shared, but is different since those buildings predate the current requirements that are included. And these requirements that are currently included in the SPIDWIS and AC7, these were evaluated based on a FEMA P695 methodology that included experimental testing, numerical modeling, nonlinear uh, static and dynamic analyses, and peer panel review that was an essential part of the process. And the documentation for this project is now available as a USDA Forest Products Laboratory report and can be accessed online. It has all the information regarding the topics I mentioned. 
Um, so one such example of the information that is included in a report is a CLT chill wall test. We're not going to get into that other information in detail, but they are provided in the report. The photo shows a four-panel, multi-panel configuration under loading that is seen here, the way a photo is taken from the left to right, where individual panel walking is observed, and the panels are shown with the corresponding components. And these are design method prescribed connectors. You can see angle brackets that connect CLT panels to the supporting elements, then vertical adjoining panel edge connectors that connect these panels at vertical edges, and rods are provided at each end of the wall for overturning moment restraint. And the plot on the left shows the solid line shows the aesthetic behavior, the load deformation behavior of the same wall. And the dashed red line shows the model that was then fit to this and was subsequently used in the numerical modeling part of the project. And in terms of the failure, the typical failure for all these shear wall tests were in the nailed connection with no to minimal damage to the panels themselves. And therefore, for subsequent tests, then the new connectors were placed um, offset from existing uh, holes. Here's an example photo from the shake table test that were performed on a simple two-story platform type uh, structure at the UCSD uh, shake table facility. And the tests were performed on uh, shear walls with different configurations, and I'll get to that in a little bit. And um, the test, shake table tests were performed with different ground motion intensities that included service, uh, service level earthquake SLE, design earthquake DE, and maximum considered earthquake MCE. And examples of these configurations are shown here. In the upper right, there's, this is a two panel, multi-panel configuration with the corresponding components that I mentioned earlier. The photo on the top left shows a four panel, multi-panel configuration with all the components. And the photo on the bottom shows the same configuration. However, in this case, perpendicular walls were used to see if they would have any adverse effects, which the test showed they didn't. And the damage, similar to the CLT shear wall test that we saw um, earlier, the damage in this case was also observed in the connectors and tests of the same uh, wall panels were performed with the same panels, but with different connectors, with new connectors that were uh, were uh, placed in a new location. Here's the video of the shake table test that illustrates the rocking behavior of the individual panels that we also observed in the CLT shear wall test. Here are a few figures from SpidWiz Appendix B commentary that illustrate some features of the design method that lead to that predictable performance uh, that we saw at the wall level and at the system level for our shake table tests. The upper left, you'll see a single panel shear sure wall with connectors along the base and top and then hold down rods at each end. And um, to the right, we see a four panel multi-panel configuration with all the individual panels making up the multi-panel wall having the same aspect ratio. And these aspect ratio range from two to one to four to one, the limits that are in the SPIDWIS design method. And in the rightmost figure, there's an illustration of the multi-panel, again, four panel, multi-panel configuration with the requirements considering the loading that we're seeing here, what we call tension end panel and compression end panel requirements that Phil is going to discuss that later. And the bottom figure shows the form shape of a shear wall under unit shear loading. And rocking of the individual wall is seen here, similar to the wall level test that uh, we saw earlier and the shake table test. And with that as background, I'd like to turn it back to Phil to continue the example. Thank you, Omar. As mentioned previously, this example will focus on the shear wall shown in the typical floor plan along line four. 
Okay, this part of the seismic force resisting system for a three-story, six-unit townhouse structure. The shear wall length is 33 feet, three inches. And we're gonna see this dimension again later in the program. Uh, for this example, the roof trusses span from top to bottom, north to south. Floor panels span left to right, west to east. The example uses load and resistance factor design to be consistent with the design format basis of the knee provisions. Allowable stress design is also permissible as a design method under ASCE and special design provisions for wind and seismic, and will provide an equivalent design to that resulting from LRFD. Here are the weight assumptions for this example. The roof ceiling is light frame construction, assumed to be 25 pounds per square foot. Floor consisting of five layer CLT is 35 pounds per square foot. Interior walls consisting of three layer CLT, wood frame, jip, and sound insulation, 20 pounds per square foot. And exterior walls consisting of three layer CLT, wood frame, exterior stucco finish, 30 pounds per square foot. As a point of reference for those new to cross laminated timber, for these specific gravity equal 0.42 panels, that's spruce pine fir used in the example, and moisture content of 12%, we get a density of 28 pounds per cubic foot. For comparison of panels were Douglas fir, uh, the density is approximately 33 pounds per cubic foot. For the three ply panels in this example, uh, those are the wall panels. Weight is approximately 9.6 pounds per square foot of wall area. And for the five ply uh, panels in this example, those are the floor panels. Weight is approximately 16 pounds per square foot of area. This table is very similar to what Omar showed on slide eight. Uh, the example will use the cross laminated timber shear wall system associated with R equals three. Um, omega equals three, CD equals three. The aspect ratio panels used in this example, uh, shear wall will be two to one. That's height of panel to length of individual panel will be two to one. While the system allows a range of aspect ratios, it's required that all panels within a multi-panel CLT shear wall have the same aspect ratio. Omar mentioned uh, this reference to section 14.5 was important. And uh, we tend to focus on the seismic coefficients and height limits, but their use is limited to systems with prescribed design and detailing requirements. For uh, CLT shear walls, section 14.5 of ASCE 7 references SPIDWIS 2021, where both the CLT shear wall system types are defined and design and detailing requirements are provided. So for the CLT shear wall system with R equals three, um, SDS equals one and importance factor equals one. The seismic base shear can be calculated using ASCE equation 12.8-2 for short period structures. The portion of base shear tributary to the CLT shear wall along line four is 42 kips. And we're gonna see this uh, over and over in the example. So here we have the CLT shear walls along line four, along with a more complete view of seismic force and dead loads acting on the wall. The shear wall length is 33 feet, three inches. It's made of seven panels per shear wall at each story. Each panel has a height of nine feet, six inches, and it has a length of four feet, nine inches. And that's what gives this aspect ratio of two. So we get H over B sub S, nine feet, six inches. And we're gonna see this again over and over in the example. The floor thickness is approximately seven inches, which gives a story height of 10 feet, one inch. Vertical distribution of shear shown on the left is determined using ASCE section 12.8.3 with K equals one for short period structures. The 190 PLF, is the self-weight of the walls only at the third level. Recall that the roof framing span between north-south walls. The 793 PLF is from wall weight and floor weight. Uh, these dead loads are a factor in overturning calculations that we'll see later. 
And the table on the right shows cumulative lateral force for stories three, two, and one shear walls, along with unit shear force in each wall. For example, 15.9 kips, story three, equates to 477 pounds per linear feet of wall length, uh, assuming that 33 feet uh, four inch wall length. 33.5 kips equates to 1,009 PLF, and 42.3 kips equates to 1,273 PLF. This design unit shear force is the primary dr driver behind the rest of the CLT shear wall design. It's a factor in the number of angle connectors at top and bottom of the wall and at adjoining panel edges for shear walls at each story level. It's a factor in the design for overturning and deflection calculations. So we'll see these unit shear values again through this example. There we go. These will come up again. Here's the equation for the LRFD design unit shear capacity for seismic for the prescribed shear connectors required for the CLT shear wall system. This equation is from the nominal unit shear equation B2 in SPIDWIS. It is used to determine the number of shear connectors to provide design unit shear capacity greater than the design unit shear force. So let's go through the equation terms and start at the bottom of the list and work our way up. Uh, phi is the resistance factor. It equals 0.5 uh, for seismic design per SPIDWIS 4141. CG is the CLT panel specific gravity factor. It is one for this example because the specific gravity of the panels is 0.42, but it can be less than one for lower specific gravity panels. B sub S is the individual CLT panel length. 2,605 is the connector nominal shear capacity. This can be calculated directly using NDS provision for nails in a metal angle connector uh, to the CLT panel. N is the number of angle connectors at the bottom of the panel face. The SPIDWIS design method requires the number of angle connectors at the top to be equal to the number at the bottom. And for multi-panel shear walls, the number of connectors at the adjoining vertical panel edge are required to be the number at the bottom times the panel aspect ratio. That's the panel height to the panel length. Uh, for this example, that's two, as we mentioned previously. These requirements produce equal unit shear resistance at horizontal and vertical panel edges. If you're wondering what the maximum unit shear capacity might be, assuming four connectors per foot of panel length, that's two on one side and two on the other side of a panel, uh, we can come up with approximately 5,200 PLF LRFD. And that would be uh, calculated here. I'm gonna try to show it. Here it would be 0 0.5 times four, 2605, one foot of length in a CG factor of one equals 5200, 5200 PLF LRFD. That's approximately 3,700 PLF allowable stress design. And so this is a little more than twice the unit shear capacity of nailed wood structural panel shear walls. So we get about a little more than twice the capacity out of the system than what we're used to seeing in nailed with structural panel shear walls. But we also have half the R factor for this, system, say three instead of say six and a half. So we're also dealing with about twice the design forces. So here we see the required number of connectors to exceed the design unit shear force. Starting with story three, we see two connectors required at top and bottom uh, panel edge. Uh, that's multiplied by the aspect ratio to get the number of connectors at the vertical edge is four. Uh, similarly, at the second story walls, we see four connectors at top and bottom edge, eight at vertical edge, and then at the bottom story, five top and bottom edge, and then 10 at the vertical edge. So one ob observation regarding the design unit shear capacity at each uh, story level is that it closely matches the design unit shear force from slide 23. We'll see later for calculating overturning T forces that closely tuning the design shear capacity to the design unit shear force will lead to reduced uh, overturning tension forces because this overturning tension force is associated with two times the design shear capacity of the provided connectors. 
And just as a reminder here, um, the connectors provide at the third story provide 400, 548 PLF of resistance. The induced shear from slide uh, 23 was 477. At the second story is 1009. And at the first story is 1273. The provided resistance is greater than the required force. So the figure on the left is what the shear walls along line four look like with the required connectors shown. Darkened connectors are on the near face and light connectors are on the far side of the panel. Uh, starting with story three, we've got uh, two connectors, uh, top and bottom, and four along the vertical edges. I'm going to show these here, two, two, and four. For story two, we have four connectors, top and bottom, and eight along the vertical panel edges. And for story one, we've got four, five connectors, top and bottom, and 10 along the vertical panel edges. And if you look at the uh, plan view at the very bottom here, uh, you can see that connectors are uh, staggered on each face of the wall. Slightly to the right of this uh, figure is a blow up view of the angle connector. And then above that figure is the adjoining vertical panel edge connector. Each side of that connector has eight of the same size nails as used in the vertical leg of the angle connector. Con conventional hold downs are also included in this figure and they are visible at the wall ends. Now we'll get to the design requirements for those later. Four are used at story one and story two walls and two are used at story three. And then figure six, six to the right shows this um, section view of the hold down location and to show uh, connectors at the wall floor intersections. So this calculation is to check the adequacy of the CLT panel itself for resistance to in-plane shear. Uh, for this example, we use the shear value from the CLT panel manufacturer's evaluation report. It is uh, an ASD value. And so uh, this example, uh, using NDS table 10.3.1, uh, calculates the LRFD in-plane unit shear capacity of the panel. And so from NDS, uh, we get uh, phi equal 0.75. For this property, for short-term loading, lambda equals one, format conversion factor of 2.88, and then the manufacturer's property. And we end up with an LRFD uh, unit shear resistance of 20,849 pounds. So uh, looking back at the design unit shears, we see the panel itself has uh, significantly more uh, shear capacity than is required. So looking back uh, at our induced unit shears uh, from table 6.4, we see the panel itself has significantly more capacity than is required by design. You know, if we compare this panel capacity of 20,849 PLF to the maximum capacity we calculated, we'll see that, you know, even when connectors or design demands are very high and connectors are closely spaced, that the CLT panel itself exceeds, uh, greatly exceeds the capacity that can be developed by the connectors. Okay, so now we're going to move into hold down design. And this is where uh, special design provisions for wind and seismic CLT shear requirements aim to ensure the strength of the prescribed shear connectors are developed to match the load deformation performance observed in testing that Omar described. The observed deformation behavior of a multi-panel shear wall is depicted in the figure and it's characterized by individual panel rocking behavior under unit shear loading. And this behavior combined with overstrength and overturning device relative to shear capacity connectors used in testing is addressed by two special requirements. Uh, number one, only dead load tributary, tributary to the tension end panel is considered in resisting overturning induced uplift. And number two, required T force for hold down strength is based on unit shear forces equal to not less than two times the design unit shear capacity of the shear wall connectors, not two times the calculated design force. The first requirement minimizes influences of influence of dead load on hold down design and is intended to not allow a consideration of dead load offset of overturning uplift based on an assumed rigid body overturning of the entire wall. 
So the important part here is we're not assuming the wall overturns as a rigid monolith. The second requirement is one that aligns with the overstrength of hold down and testing. It leads to increased hold down requirements where greater design shear capacity is provided than associated with the design unit shear force. So here's the T-force requirement per ASCE load combination for counteracting loads and the SPIDWIS requirements. So SPIDWIS equation C B dash two provides T-force based on moment equilibrium of the tension end panel. Based on the two times unit shear capacity requirement, we have the following required T-force for hold down size and strength. For story three, two times the design unit shear capacity of 1,097 PLF, the resulting T-force is 11,293 pounds. For story two, two times the design unit shear capacity uh, gives a resulting T-force of 34,540 pounds, and it accumulates the, uh, it includes the accumulated T from story three above. So right here. And then story one, two times uh, the unit shear capacity is, uh, gives a resulting T-force of 63,968 pounds uh, and includes the accumulated T-force from story two above. So a conventional hold down device is used in this example. It has an LRFD design tension capacity of 17,678 pounds and an associated deflection of 0.253 inches. Uh, the device deflection will be a factor in a later calculation. Four hold downs are used at each end of the first and second story walls. And two hold downs are used at the third story laws, walls. It's also required to limit device deformation for each story to not exceed 0.185 inches for T forces from strength design load combinations not the two times design unit shear capacity forces used for hold down strength. Using ASCE7 counteracting load combination for seismic and design unit shear force. And considering moment equilibrium of tension end panel, we get the following T forces. For story three, 4,714 pounds. For story two, 14,604 pounds. For story one, 27,472 pounds. For the most highly uh, stressed hold downs at the first story, recalling the slip of 0.253 inch for device and scaling slip based on calculated T-force, uh, we see that the delta hold down deformation is 0.098 inches, which is less than 0.185 inches. Something that you know we found um, is due to the overstrength requirement of for the hold down, that two times strength requirement it's unlikely that the hold down deformation requirement will control in design. For the overturning compression, the compression zone is required to be contained within the compression end panel and distribution of bearing stress is assumed to be uniform. Compression zone length is shown as X in the figure on the right, along with re resultant compression force C. Equations to the left are from Spidwitz commentary. The first equation, equation C, B.3, gives the solution for compression zone length X and force C based on static equilibrium of the compression end panel for design unit shear forces, not increased forces that are required for the hold down strength design, but similar to the tension end panel, only gravity load directly on the compression end panel is considered additive with shear induced overturning compression due to individual panel rocking behavior. Here's a scenario where the individual rocking uh, model reduces the calculated compression in the end panel. On the tension side, it increases it because it negated this dead load offset. And on the compression side, it reduces it because it's not additive with dead load over the length of the wall. The second equation, CB.4, provides the compression bearing resistance associated with compression perpendicular to grain stress. This uh, possible strength limit state comes into play where the CLT wall panels are bearing on the CLT floor panel, those second and third story shear walls in this example. The third equation, equation C B.5, 
provides the compression stress parallel to grain for the CLT wall panel. This strength limit state comes into play where the panel bearing is on a metal part or foundation with high bearing strength, such as uh, first story walls, which have ends of wall bearing on a metal plate. And the precise solution for compression zone length X and resultant force can be calculated by substitution of the second or third equation into the first. And Spidwitz commentary has an example for how this can be done. This table provides a solution for compression zone length X and resultant force C based on use of the ASCE7 additive load combinations. For story three, Compression zone length is two inches and resultant C force is 5,257 pounds. For story two, compression zone length is 7.64 inches and corresponding resultant C force is 20,144 pounds. And for story one, compression zone length is 4.56 inches and corresponding resultant C force is 36,545 pounds. The smaller compression zone length at the base of the first story shear walls is because bearing is on metal part or concrete part, not a CLT floor, which limits bearing to the compression perpendicular grain stresses in wood. So here's the Spidwiz equation for CLT shear wall deflection. It is equation B1 uh, in the special design provisions for wind and seismic. It has similarities to the deflection equation for nailed wood structural panel shear walls in that components of deflection are broken out but there are differences to account for the use of CLT stiffness properties and different load slip per nail associated with the prescribed nailed metal connectors. In the table, total shear wall deflection is shown as composed of panel bending and shear deflection. Sliding due to nail slip, panel rotation due to nail slip, and rigid body rotation. This final co component is in place primarily for single panel shear walls and recognition that deflection from this term relative to total deflection is small for longer multi-panel shear walls, which do not overturn as rigid bodies. So here's a shear wall deflection summary component com component. Looking to the far right, uh, we see for story three, the total deflection is 0.24 inches. For story two, total deflection is 0.33 inches. And for story one, the total deflection is 0.35 inches. Looking at columns two and three for deflection of CLT panel itself, right here, uh, we see increasing deflections. We start from story three and proceed to story one. The same panel thickness at each story level and increasing unit shear in the shear walls as we move from story three to story one explains the increasing deflection trend. So panel thickness is constant, panel properties are constant, but there's increasing shear leading to increasing deflection. So looking at column floor, deflection due to nail load slip, it's almost constant across all stories. Recall that the number of connectors at each story was set to closely match the design unit shear force. As a result, the load per nail is similar across all three stories, and so is deflection from nail load slip. The largest component of deflection is due to nail load slip. And at the bottom of the page, the final check of conformance to the 2.5% story drift limit. It shows that the permissible deflection is 0.95 inches for the uh, structure, which is much larger than the max deflection uh, at the lowest story level of 0.35 inches. So the story drift limit is easily met. Here are uh, references for this example. So this concludes the example. Where do all of these resources stand now? The special design provisions for wind and seismic 2021 is referenced in the 2021 IBC. And will continue as a reference in the 2024 IBC. ASCE 722, minimum design loads and associated criteria for buildings and other structures is currently available in PDF format from ASCE, and it is targeted for reference in the 2024 IBC. The 2020 NEHER provisions contains the CLT shear wall system types in SPIDWIS 21 and seismic coefficients appearing in ASCE 722. 
Um, also, the NEHR provisions include extensive commentary in the system, and all of it's available for free download. As mentioned before, um, the requirements are very similar uh, in the NEHR provisions to what appear in SPIDWIS 2021, but they are not identical. And the NEHR provisions design example document contains the full CLT Shearwall example described today and will be available uh, and is available under the name FEMA P2192. And this concludes the presentation. Thank you for your interest. All right. Thank you, Phil and Omar. That was a great presentation. And we have we've gotten quite a few questions that have come in already. Uh, so Omar and Phil, are you guys uh, on and ready to answer some questions that have come in? Yes, yes, it's good. Seems like people have been paying attention, so that's good. <laughs> um, so it Absolutely. seems like um, the questions that we got, so there's a certain theme to it and I've kind of, based on what I saw, I've been sort of categorized it into like three or four. For example, there's certain system level questions. Then there is aspect question about aspect ratios. I guess we should have had it in one of our slides as well. And then questions about the connectors. So we're going to go maybe switch between these connectors and some of the questions. I will address those and some of the questions. But we'll answer those and then we'll see. Um, we'll go one by one, maybe switch between the different topics and all that. So I'll start with. Um, one of the first questions was that um, in terms of the slide 17, that was a shape table test that was performed. Again, the system level question that once, if once these are after, so I'll read the question, after a structure is subjected to high shear loads, such as shown in the video slide 17, does the apparent loosening of the nail fast, fasteners render the structure no longer usable? Um, that is even if the, structure doesn't collapse. Correct. So that is like similar to what we observed in the CLT shear wall test and um, CLT shake table test. Of course, there's a certain level of damage and specifically for the level of damage that depends on, on the ground motion intensity, especially for an MCE level, we we, um, we expect, we think that panels would be reu reusable based on our experience. And then these new connectors are then will be um, replaced the way we did with the shake table test that we performed ourselves. We remove the connectors, put new connectors, and we perform new tests. So that's what we would expect that that's what would happen. The panels will be reusable. Then another question, again, system level question is that in terms of um, the continuous, so this is, um, the question is, is it possible to de detail shear walls where the walls are continuous and the floors are discontinuous? So the walls extend to the roof, but are braced at floor lengths by four. So this is referring to balloon tap construction. Is this allowed or not? In one of the definitions, if you um, go to SPIDWIS, and that's one of the first items that defines the system is a platform type construction. And the definition is specific to um, where floor panels bear on the wall panels below. And then, so this is defined. It's kind of outside the scope and we don't want to, um, we want to be cautious in terms of talking about it, but there are some efforts in terms of balloon tap construction. Um, at some other university, then of course they have to go through a full detailed FEMA P695 method to be able to uh, codify it. And then that's a whole nother level of effort as well. Um, but yeah, so we're going to leave it at that. We're not, because uh, we have to be cautious in terms of identifying certain aspects of that system. Um, then in terms of, um, I'm, I'm, again, we got a lot of questions. So I have to go through these um, one by one. So it will take me a uh, sec. So um, one question is, um, what are the, again, the aspect ratios? So there's a bunch of questions and we're going to go through again um, in terms of the aspect ratios one by one. So what is what are the allowable aspect ratios that for CLT wall panels? So and I'll let Phil answer that question. Oh, okay. Yep. So as Omar mentioned, we had a few questions related to CLT wall panel aspect ratio. Um, and so what are the allowable aspect ratios? And so for that 
CLT shear wall system with R equals three, uh, the spid width requirement is that the aspect ratio ranges from two to four. So uh, within that system, uh, wall lines in that system can be made of panels with aspect range of, uh, aspect ratios that vary between two to four. That's height of panel to length. And then for the uh, high aspect ratio uh, shear wall system with R of four, uh, the requirement is that the aspect ratio of all panels in that system need to have uh, height to length of four. Um, so there's a question about, well, what happens if your panel aspect ratio is less than two? And so, um, and an example of that was shown uh, in Omar's slide uh, portion, uh, that European example where, you know, these long panels were being uh, lifted into place. You know, something like that definitely has an aspect ratio um, less than two, not to mention there's, uh, you know, holes pre-cut for windows in one of those panels. But if it's less than two, it's it's not part, it doesn't meet the system definition that's in SpidWiz and required by ASCE for the R factor. So the, you know, the R factor of three doesn't apply, the R factor of four wouldn't apply. The special design provisions for wind and seismic 21 does have uh, a section, a clause uh, that in low seismic areas will allow uh, uh, any aspect ratio, you know, even less than two, uh, provided uh, R factor of one is used and it's approved. And of course, uh, for seismic category A, aspect ratio less than two can be used um, because there's not a requirement for, you know, a R factor based equivalent lateral seismic force. I'm going to cover one other aspect ratio question, and this I think has more to do with the R equals three, where you can have a range of aspect ratio panels in your shear wall systems. And the, the question is, can different wall lines have different uh, panel aspect ratios? And the answer to that is yes, in the R equals three system. So uh, there might be scenarios where uh, maybe you have a narrow, you, you don't only have a wall length available for narrow panels between windows and doors, for example, and you might have a four to one aspect ratio there, but then another portion of wall, you have longer links uh, where you use uh, longer wall panels. And so that's perfectly acceptable under the R equals three system. And in fact, in the in the background report that uh, Omar was mentioning in the early portions, uh, there were uh, these archetype designs that incorporated uh, ranges of aspect ratios on a given story to kind of uh, tease out what effect that has on the design. I wanna cover one other uh, question. It came up multiple times, um, but I do think it was answered on a later slide. It was whether these connectors all needed to be on the same side of the panel or whether they're required to be staggered on opposite sides of the panel. And um, the design requirements uh, cover this along with commentary. It is permissible to have all the connectors on one panel face or to stagger them on opposite faces. And we gave an example uh, where they're at the bottom story there's five connectors at top and bottom of wall, and those were uh, staggered, you know, on opposing faces of the wall. But it would have been perfectly acceptable to also have them all on one wall face. Okay. So, um, so those are some connector-related questions, um, or or uh, aspect ratio-related questions. A couple of other. Um, um, okay, so um, sorry, it's, it's taken us a while because we have a lot of questions. So the other question is in terms of uh, proprietary aspect of it. Uh, the question is um, in terms of that, um, the question was asked whether there's an ICC, so uh, in terms of shear and hold down connectors that we have, is there an ICC evaluation report that have been tested for what published capacities? 
and are they available in the market for CLT shear walls? So um, again, the system and the purpose of doing the FEMA P695 methodology and the background behind that was to make sure we use design method prescribed connectors, and these are generic connectors. And, um, and this is provided in uh, SPIDO's Appendix B commentary. So any changes in the connectors themselves would be subject to an evaluation method. And then this would be performed at the connector level and at the wall level itself. And then the system is shown to be whether uh, through testing or an equivalent FEMA P795. And also if an another more detail would be again, another similar study to P uh, FEMA P695, but generally it would be either a test report or um, at a wall level, system level, or uh, FEMA P795 to demonstrate equivalency. Um, then, and, oh, okay, so this question is, um, can, so this question is similar to the earlier question about sort of balloon type construction. Um, can the CLT be used for bearing walls? If yes, where can we find the design values? Are there any, same for a glue laminate timber? So this, yes, CLT can be used for uh, bearing walls and there are provisions for that as well in terms of on how to consider it in terms of um, the seismic design. So there's um, seismic force resistant system or, and then there's that non-seismic force resistant component to it as well. And there are provisions for that in the SPIDWIS to um, consider the effects of that. And um, yeah, so that. And then um, to kind of follow the theme, um, Oh, so another in terms of connectors, uh, has any testing been done using wood splines instead of metal connectors? So in terms of the actual shear wall tests, we are not aware of any shear wall testing with wood splines for shear wall, CLT shear walls, but for CLT diaphragms, there's been quite a lot of efforts going on. As you would know, CLT is a very, new system and then there's quite a lot of efforts to look into the different lateral force resistance systems and of course the diaphragm performance for that as well and there are quite a lot of efforts in terms of the diaphragm aspect of it and uh, they have used various type of connectors ranging from uh, very generic type connectors uh, plates and nails and to proprietary connectors to something with uh, plywood splines, so so various range. Just so there there are some studies for diaphragms, but not for CLT shear wall that we're aware of. Um, we're, so I'm, I'm looking ahead while Omar's answering. Omar, if you've answered, please stop me. <laughs> okay, so uh, there is a question um, on appears it's going to be related to slide 24, where the unit shear capacity, of the connectors, is being calculated. And um, it says, why is C sub G much higher than the G? So why is the um, C sub G factor uh, equal to one much higher than the specific gravity of the panel 0.42? And uh, the way to look at that C sub G factor is it's an adjustment factor and the reference point is it's 1.0 when specific gravity of the panel is 0.42. And then when we have lower specific gravity uh, panels, the connection uh, values go down and then that CG factor just kind of scales it down. Uh, very similar to what you get from a straight NDS calculation. Okay, so CG and G are different things. One's an adjustment factor, one's actually specific gravity. And then there's one other question that's uh, come up a little bit um, and it is, it is addressed uh, broadly in the detailed 25 page example, but it's, um, you know, are there restrictions on cutting holes and drilling through these walls, you know, for electrical and HVAC and plumbing and other things. And there are no sp specific prescribed restrictions uh, in special design provisions for wind and seismic for that. The requirement would be that where those uh, holes and cuts happen, that they be uh, evaluated through an engineer design approach uh, using NDS. And, um, you know, there's uh, 
a detailed example, especially um, when we get into the hold down design and there's huge forces coming through the hold downs. Uh, we wanna evaluate the CLT panel in the vicinity of the hold down to make sure there's adequate uh, tension capacity in that portion of the panel, as well as uh, you know, group tear out uh, capacity of the panel. Uh, Lori, I think we've hit all the categories. Um, I'm not seeing it. Uh, Omar is looking for some. That's, that's good. Questions. We're getting close to the top of the hour here. So if you guys don't have any further questions, we I, I think we can go ahead and turn it over to Marcy. This concludes the AIA continuing education presentation.